Good morning. It is truly an honor to be a part of the service of worship this morning on this last Sunday of Advent, what is sometimes also known as Christmas Sunday. It's always a pleasure to be with friends and fellow church members here at the Sweetwater Christian Church, and I am pleased to be with you remotely today. If you have a Bible, I would suggest that we begin by reading from the text of Scripture, prayerfully, with due meditation, reading this morning from the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. A rather familiar text for most of us, I'm sure, but let's hear what the gospel says to us this morning nonetheless. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was simply no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. May God add a a rich blessing to this, our reading of Holy Word today. Will you allow me a moment of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my strength, my Redeemer. Amen. Keep Christ in Christmas. Have you heard that before? It's a recurring cry of complaint for many in our society. Keep Christ in Christmas. Now this phrase doesn't have the compelling appeal it once had, maybe because it has become something of a seasonal cliché. We've heard it so often, we just don't pay it much mind anymore these days. And maybe it's lost some of its earlier appeal or earlier impact only because it just doesn't ring true for most of us anymore. After all, it's well known among us now that the X in Xmas, an object of complaint, is just an ancient shorthand form of the word Christ, the first letter of Christ in the language of our original New Testament. To be sure, much popular music this time of year is purely secular. Jingle bells, for instance. 
have a holly jolly Christmas. Grandma got run over by a reindeer. But traditional carols still retain pride of place on the radio and on best-selling holiday albums. And, and yes, I'll admit, images of Santa Claus are everywhere this time of year, but they have by no means unseated the more revered icons of the infant Jesus snuggled in his mother's arms. For many years, I had a little figurine on my office desk during the seasons of Advent and Christmas. You may have seen one like it. It features Santa Claus, fur cap in hand, kneeling prayerfully over Bethlehem's manger and child. It was a powerful symbol for me, and you could probably imagine why. But then I recently read an article that reminded me even this seemingly innocent object could be and, and perhaps should be construed as nothing more than American commercialism paying homage to the inspiration for the biggest merchandising season of the year. You'd think that I would have figured that out by myself, cultural cynic and practical theologian that I am. Chalk it up to the power of myths, a power to which none of us is entirely immune. To be perfectly honest, though, I am not terribly concerned about the forced removal of Christ from Christmas by people who may be openly antagonistic to our most cherished Christian traditions and beliefs. I have far greater concern about something even more insidious, a gradual watering down of the Christmas message by much beloved myths that have attached to the story of Jesus' birth. Myths that Christians, that we Christians, largely accept without question and without thought to the possible negative impact they might have on our personal perceptions of the Incarnation or their ultimate implications for our own individual faith practice. Now before I proceed any further, I should probably clarify what I mean by myth. For purposes of the homily here today, I understand myths as the stories we live by. The stories we live by. That's a rather simplistic explanation, I know. Here's a dictionary definition, if you prefer. A myth is a popular belief or tradition that has grown up around something or someone that embodies the ideals and the institutions of a particular society. Our nation, for example, is held together in part by a number of powerful and very persuasive myths. Here's an example that we all know by heart. It is enshrined in the closing words of our Pledge of Allegiance. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Those last six words unquestionably represent our common hope and aim, but we clearly haven't arrived there yet as a people. The idea that everyone in the United States enjoys equal liberty and justice is a myth, not a fact. But we sadly use this myth, oh, so very often, to deny injustices that exist around us, to disavow our complicity in those injustices, and then we go on living as though they make no difference to anyone at all. Myths are stories that we live by, my friends. Far more than we may recognize or are willing to acknowledge, myths help fashion our consciousness and our moral conscience. They form and unify us in communities, small or large. They influence and describe our faith and spiritual behavior, whether as individuals 
or church. But the message this morning is not a message of discouragement, folks. I don't want you to stop listening because this doesn't sound like any Christmas sermon you've ever heard before. There is good news coming, if you'll just bear with me a little more. I'd like to share with you a little story here, if I may, from prehistoric times. From November of 1987, in fact. We were decorating the church sanctuary for Advent. One of our ladies was setting up a, a lovely nativity scene on the chancel when I walked by. That's not quite correct, I said to her in passing. What are you talking about, she wanted to know. She asked, so I explained. You've placed the wise men at the manger. And that's not how the Bible has it. She took umbrage, if you can believe it, took umbrage at this casual observation and began to argue the point with me. We went to the source, and she finally conceded. Why then do so many nativity scenes include the three kings, she asked me. And that's a very good question. The answer, because it's part of of a Christmas myth. And they weren't kings, by the way, but astrologers, magi, or wise men. And we don't know that there were only three. There may have been more or less. Myths, again. So why does this even matter? The kings, or wise men, were there at some time after all, weren't they? Yes but not until many weeks or months later. And it matters because it takes something significant away from the birth story. Generally speaking, the birth of a child at that time in Palestine was greeted with crowds of well-wishers and general community-wide celebration. By comparison, Jesus' birth was a very quiet very private affair. Now, I know some of you will be asking yourselves, well, how about the shepherds and the angels and the animals there in the stable? The Bible doesn't mention any animals, nor does it say how many shepherds actually came to pay their regards. And according to Luke, only the shepherds were aware of angels attending from above. I think it is safe to say the place of Jesus' birth was rather dark, rough, dirty, smelly, and lonely. Even though our myths about the occasion have it clean and brightly lit, with a host of people and heavenly beings there at the bedside, angels and livestock, rich people and poor, men and women, young and old, a boy with a drum, a girl with flowers, all rejoicing over the birth of the long-awaited Messiah. Sadly, that is all myth. In fact, Jesus was not warmly welcomed by anyone other than his parents at his birth, nor even recognized for who he truly was other than by the angels, and that to the shepherds. A foreshadowing of things to come? Perhaps. And I pray we don't make the same mistake ourselves. Christmas Day will be quite a bit different for many, if not all of us, this year, I suspect, with fewer family gatherings, no hugs and kisses for Grandma, but one feature for most of us will surely remain. When the holiday is past, we'll feel a little let down. Either from a sense of relief, thank goodness that's over, or regret. Sadly, that's over. And all of this from a persistent, pervasive myth that Christmas comes but once a year or more precisely, 
one day a year. And what day is that? I heard you, December 25th. And why is that? Because it's the day of Jesus' birth? Well, that's been the accepted story in much of the world the last 1,500 years or so, but there's nothing in the Bible to suggest that it is actually so. In fact, some of the information Luke gives us that we read moments ago about nearby shepherds actually implies an early spring date instead. Now again, you may ask at this point, why does this matter? Well, the issue for me and many others isn't the date itself, artificial and arbitrary as it may be, but the idea that we dedicate only one day each year to a wholehearted appreciation or celebration of Jesus' birth. Now, this is not to say that we should have to put up with an elf on the shelf any longer than we do now. Only that we should give more extended thought prayer, and grateful devotion to the truly glad tidings for us from this remarkable event. After all, the scriptures remind us, we who have lived in darkness have seen a great light, for a child is born to us, a son is given us. He is called Wonderful, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, The Spirit of the Lord is upon him for announcing good news to the oppressed, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty, peace, and the favor of God for all people in every place at every time. In truth, this child is Emmanuel, God with us. God with us not just on one day in the year, but every day, which should elicit from us due gratitude every day at least, and more than a little rejoicing perhaps. You know, you can sing joy to the world any day of the year. And I think it would be beneficial if we should offer more frequent gifts of grace to family, friends, and people we don't even know by name so that in that way we might extend the blessings of God in the person of Christ Jesus to literally everyone, everywhere, every day. We diminish the profound significance of Jesus' birth when we reduce it to anything less. I was leading a church Bible study one fall many years ago a Bible study about the birth of Jesus and what it means, when someone brought up the subject of Christmas carols. And so, of course, we had to go around the room and let everyone share their personal favorites. One carol was mentioned several times. You may know it. Feel free to sing along. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky all looked down where he lay, the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. It's one of my favorites too, I have to say. Well, contrarian that I am, I couldn't leave well enough alone that day. Right there in front of God and every person in that study group, I proceeded to find fault with one phrase in the second verse of the song, which reads in part, The little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. What can I say? I was glad just to get out of the room alive. Now I have to agree it's a sweet sentiment, but the notion that baby Jesus didn't cry is a myth. Have I gone too far now? Okay then, if that's the case, let me ask you mothers out there, what would you say about a baby 
who doesn't cry. You'd wonder if it was okay, wouldn't you? Babies are supposed to cry unless, perchance, the baby is God. And there's the rub. The Bible reminds us over and over again that Jesus was just like us, as human as you or I in every way. In point of fact, the Scriptures tell us He had to be like us to bear our sin and suffering on the cross, to bring about our salvation and our reconciliation with God. To make the infant Jesus uncrying then is to make him in some way unfeeling and unhuman, which we really dare not do. Now, don't be too concerned if this seems a little confusing or downright overwhelming. The church as a whole has wrestled with the dilemma of Jesus' humanity almost from the time of his resurrection. To what extent was Jesus human? To what extent was he divine? Still, any myth that makes him less than human or superhuman in any way removes him to some degree from our life experience. It makes him less accessible to our sorrows, our distress. It elevates his example to a level that we cannot hope to attain and merely increases our feelings of anguish and guilt in the end. Do you see where unchallenged myths can take us? When they are myths about Jesus, they take us somewhere God doesn't want us to go. God was more like you than not. Jesus is more like you than not. And you are more like Jesus in God's estimate than you know. And there's the good news for you. Good news for us all. A little girl came to me once with a picture that she had created and she was really anxious for me to see. She was only five or six years old, as I recall. So the artwork was quite primitive, but it was easy enough to tell what she had drawn. It was a representation of Jesus' birth. There in her picture was a stable, Mary, Joseph, and the baby lying on a manger bed of straw. There was a shepherd, no wise men, thankfully, and a few angels hovering overhead. There was a dog, a cat, a donkey, and a camel, and one animal I didn't recognize at first. That's Rudolph, she told me with obvious glee. And then she pointed out his red nose. I didn't have the heart to tell her there were no reindeer in Bethlehem. But I did compliment her artistry. I wanted to be encouraging after all. So I told her, baby Jesus looks very lifelike in this picture. Well, she giggled when I said that, and she told me, that's me. Don't you see? Jesus looks just like me. Wow, I remember thinking at the time. That's a Christmas story we would all do well to live by. And on this Christmas Sunday, I hope you will agree. Amen. Amen.